Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Lloyd Stephan. Uh, he will teach us the seminar on moral obligation and punishment. Uh, he is professor of philosophy and uh, religion studies at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania, United States of America. Uh, he is director of the Center for Dialogue, Ethics, and Spir Spirituality and uh, the Lehigh Prison Project. Uh, you want to know more about this prison uh, project during the week, of course. Yeah. Uh, Professor Lloyd Stephan uh, has a PhD from Brown University, and he is the author uh, or editor uh, of 11 books in ethics and moral philosophy. And he has addressed such topics as the death penalty, uh, abortion, uh, ethics of war, and men of life ethics. His book, Ethics and Experience, Moral Theory from Just War to Abortion, from 2012, lays out a distinctive uh, nature law approach to ethics that integrates different theoretic approaches in ethics. Other books of Professor Lloyd Stephan are New Perspectives in the End of Life, Essays on Care and the Intimacy of Dying, from 2012, Death, Time, Culture, an Interdisciplinary Interrogation, from 2013, Holy War, Just War, Exploring the Moral Meaning of Religion's value, uh, Violence, uh, from 2007. Uh, well, uh, in this seminar, we will investigate uh, on obligation and accountability, theory of punishments, and emotion factors that affect how we conceive responsibility, special, legal, and moral responsibility. The seminar will take place from Monday in this uh, lab fix, from Monday to ter Thursday, from 2 o'clock to 5 half p.m., with a break in the middle. Well, uh, this seminar is supported by Fulbright in a partnership with Paperis. I would like especially to thank the Fulbright program for all support that enables us to get in touch with a specialist in the field about punishment and obligation and to exchange experience and knowledge. Dear Lloyd, uh, welcome at Insinus and uh, thank you very much for the partnership and uh, all support. So can you hear me okay? If I talk here like this, you can hear me? Well, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, um, again, my name is Lloyd Stephan, and um, um, I do not speak Portuguese. I'm doing some things with Babel, but I won't have it done by the time this course is done. So um, I will try to speak slowly. If you need anything repeated, I am more than happy to do that. Um, so please slow me down and do what you need to get from me what you can. My hope is that um, in, in the, I should be louder. Okay, that's better. Okay, that in the week ahead, we will um, have a chance at the beginning today to have discussion. Um, I'm a professor. Um, I'm, I've also got other responsibilities, but as a professor, I like to um, go into a classroom and have discussions with, um, with students. Now, I, I sent along quite a few readings um, to take a look at, and um, we, we don't need to go through them one by one, but my hope is that from your reading experience, we will generate some, some questions um, that all of us can participate in helping to answer. Um, this is not an issue where um, I have all the answers to things. I, I certainly do not. But in the, the philosophical part of our lives, we need to talk about these things together and see what we, we can figure out. Um, the, the, the question about moral obligation and punishment is a very serious question. 
it, it goes to questions about our humanity, our fundamental humanity, um, what the foundations of our uh, claims on one another are. So um, the hope is that this will be a, a conversation that, that you can participate in, and um, I will look forward to your contributions, and I look forward to learning from you. Um, to start things off, I mean, I have some things to talk about, but I, I wanted to take just a few minutes um, to talk about a couple of things with, with you today. Now, you are, you are all graduate students or law students, is that correct? So, okay. Um, so some of what I may say here it may be things that you have heard before, but I still think they're important so that you know where I'm coming from and what I have to say. I wanted to, um, uh, I mean, I teach moral philosophy and ethics. And um, I think one of the places that we can begin this conversation is just reminding ourselves um, about the moral point of view. What is the moral point of view? There are lots of people who have written about this. Peter Singer, and you know, they ask questions, why should I be moral, things like that. Um, but there are some foundational issues, I think, for those of us who study ethics um, to uh, consider. So, yeah, if you, if you don't mind, um, so the first thing, I, this is for the ethical point of view, just so we all know where we're coming from here. I have uh, four different things that I would just remind you of, and then we can talk about these for a little bit. Um, So, to begin, uh, when we uh, undertake the moral point of view, again, I understand this may be um, reviewing some elementary things for, for some of you, but um, I feel a need just to let you know um, where I begin these kinds of things. The moral point of view, the ethical point of view, um, wants to take into account several different issues. Um, and and the, the first one, um, and as you know, if you study ethics, we have lots of ugly words in ethics. Um, at least they're ugly in English. Super arrogation, you know, they're just, they go on and on. And this is one of the worst ones, universalizability. But the idea of universalizability is very familiar. It's very common. It's as common in one sense as the golden rule from the scriptures do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And there are silver rules and platinum rules and different, different things. But the, the idea of universalizability is um, that when, so, when something is right to do, it is right for everyone to do. When something is wrong to do, it's wrong for everyone. So in considering an action if you can justify it, not only for yourself, but for everyone else, 
then you have a justification for doing it that we would say conforms to the moral point of view and particularly to universalizability. Okay, um, this is this is where ethics, uh, I think, in some respects, begins. We're trying to figure out um, why be moral and what constitutes, what makes up um, being moral. And the idea that what applies to me applies to you, what applies to you applies to me, is a very important aspect of the moral point of view. That's Kant. That's it, it's you know, Kant. I gave yes gave us our our best notion of that, but, but universalizability, um, you, you can find that notion going back to the Greeks. Uh, you, you know, if, if someone has a vision of the good life, and um, the good life um, requires you to be honest and generous with people, the idea is that if it's good, it's good for everybody to be that way, not just one person or another person. And we discern, we figure out what is wrong to do when um, we don't apply the rules consistently like that. Okay? So are there questions or comments you would want to make about that? Okay. Um, uh, so another aspect of the um, moral point of view is that um, uh, there, is, there is a notion of impartial justice that, that goes on, that when, um, when we think about what is right to do, good to do, the fitting thing to do, that um, justice requires that we treat people equitably. We do not use accidental features of our humanity um, to give people advantage Okay, um, so to be a white male provides a lot of advantages in contemporary society, and is that right? Is it a just society that gives more advantages to white males? And this is a question we deal with in the United States all the time. Um, and the idea is that we want to have um, justice and justice systems that are impartial even-handed, not allowing somebody's accidental features, their, their wealth, their, um, um, their gender, their religion, any of those features to uh, allow somebody to have more rights or more claims on others than someone else. So it's an idea of, of, of equity. Um, it's not always an issue of equality, as it turns out, but, but it's an issue of equity. Um, in the United States, well, I can, we've got lots of time to talk about things, but, I, but this, is, this is just one of the points um, that makes up the, um, again, the moral point of view. And when people, um, when philosophers talk about impartial observers <clears throat> or going behind a veil of ignorance, or something like that. They're making an appeal to this idea of impartial justice. So you will find this in, again, in Kant, you'll find it in John Rawls, in um, contractarianism. Uh, um, my goodness, you'll find it in, in, in utilitarianism, um, at least in rural utilitarianism. Uh, number three is really important. Um, in the moral point of view, what this means, the idea of benevol benevolence, or beneficence. Um, these are notions often um, associated with ideas like kindness. And um, you may associate that word with something like kindness. But in this context, um, what it means is that we're taking other people into account. Um, the idea that we would operate in um, the moral community totally out of self-interest is, is something that um, would destroy the moral fabric of the moral community. So um, benevolence, taking other people into account, um, becomes vitally important. As we talk this week about the role that, that sympathy or empathy play in the moral community, or, or, or ideas about fairness in treating other people, or 
paying attention to, um, you know, in, in when wrongs are committed, when um, we want to pay attention to um, victims, and we also want to pay attention to um, the situations that offenders find themselves in. Um, these are issues that go to um, uh, benevolence, okay? It means to take other people into account. You don't just take yourself into account. That winds up being a, a form of um, egoism, and um, um, you cannot generate um, the moral point of view out of egoism, okay? And the last one is that um, uh, to adopt the moral point of view means that you accept some set of um, normative principles. Um, um, like I would assume everybody in here, uh, you know, I did some research one time where uh, it was somebody in, I believe in Scandinavia, uh, said that people lie on average 200 times a day, okay? Now, I have to tell you, I think that number is a little high, okay? I don't know that I utter 200 sentences a day, on some days, um, okay? So, that, so that's a lot, but the, but the idea is that um, even if you tell 50 lies a day, and they could be non-consequential, I think, I think some lies can actually be justified um, uh, be, because we need to live in a very complex society. And if we went around telling what we thought was the truth all the time, we wouldn't be able to function. So yes, um, I, I like your tie and I like your hairstyle. And you know, you know. so, so we, we, we have um, sort of inconsequential lies that we tell and they lubricate um, the complexities of modern existence. Um, and I think that's what these researchers were trying to say with their 200 lies a day. But even if you tell just 50 lies a day, anybody who tells 50 lies a day knows that telling lies is wrong, all right? And how do we know that? We know that because mom and dad brought us up to tell the truth. We took ethics courses where we read Kant and Kant says, don't ever tell a lie. Um, we read Mill and the utilitarians, and they will say the same thing. They will say, don't tell a lie. Uh, we will have commandments in the scriptures about not bearing false witness against neighbors. So we're not permitted to tell lies, and we all know lying is wrong. So um, we have to figure out at times how um, lying might be justified. Um, but, the, but the thing is, um, when we set up normative principles, we will include things in it like we shouldn't tell lies. And reasonable people of goodwill will not disagree with that statement. That said, there could be occasions when maybe a lie is justified, okay? Now, maybe you don't believe that, and we'll have to have an argument about that, and we can, we can do that. Um, I'll look forward to that, but, um, but, but people need to have a, a set of, uh, of, of moral principles and norm, normative principles, and a lot of those principles are things that we widely accept. Uh, they would be things like keeping promises, um, um, honoring friendships, um, telling the truth. Uh, nobody um, wants to be lied to. You know, when you, when you tell a lie to someone, you're treating them as if they're not worthy of being told the truth. And um, there, is, there is a good reason to condemn the, the idea of lying. Um, but not all lies are the same. And the reason the moral life winds up being complicated is because um, things are not the same one situation to another, and it doesn't mean we can't have overarching principles. Um, I'm not a defender of moral relativism, but I'm also not an absolutist. Um, I, I, and of the two, 
um, I think absolutism is the more dangerous than relativism. And that's because people who, my students all are relativists when they come into my ethics class. And um, um, they will say, well, who are you to make a judgment about so and so? You know, who are you to do that? Um, but they can't really live relativism. So if I say to them, uh, you know, you, you are, you're a bunch of privileged folks here. You come from very wealthy backgrounds, a lot of you, and you've never really had a big challenge in your life. You've never had to really uh, overcome some kind of a huge obstacle. So in my class, no matter how well you do, I'm going to fail you. I'm going to give you an F in this class. And my relativists who are sitting out there, who are saying, you know, there is no truth, there is no this, there is no that, everything is relative, um, they will say, well, you can't do that. And I'll say, well, why is that? And they will say, because it's not fair. Fair? Where, where, where does that come from? What does that mean? And the appeal to, I'll go to the dean, I'll go to the department chair, I'll go, you know, I'll have my parents call the president. Um, they get into the moral frame very quickly, and even as relativists who say there is no overarching um, moral view of things, um, they, they find one pretty quickly. Um, so so the, the thing about relativism is that as much as you might want to defend it, you can't really live it. I haven't found people who can actually live in accordance with, with relativism. Absolutism is a different kind of problem. Um, a, a moral absolutist will often um, wind up bringing about the very thing that he or she is saying they're opposed to. Um, in the United States, the abortion debate has become like that. Um, uh, it's a very contentious issue. I suppose it is in, in, in many countries and in different cultures. Uh, but it's a, a, a very serious issue in the United States, and um, we have had uh, um, we've had murders that have taken place outside of um, clinics where uh, women will go for um, for abortions, and um, there have been bombings at abortion clinics. And um, the irony of that is that the person who raises a gun to shoot um, a doctor going to work, and I met the widow of one such doctor. I was on a, a committee with her for a while. Um, um, the, the people who do things like that are absolutely convinced of the rightness of what they're doing. But when they plan to blow up a women's clinic, who are they putting at risk? They're putting at risk women who are pregnant. They're killing pregnant women, potentially, which is the very thing that they claim to be opposed to and are so absolutely certain of the rectitude, the rightness of what they're doing that, um, uh, you know, they, they um, they will proceed to, to think about a bomb or a shooting or something like that. So um, the, the set of, of normative principles, there can be disagreements about what those are, you know, and there can be some play in all of that. But I think overall we would find some things that we really could have agreement on across cultures, um, things about um, telling the truth, keeping promises, treating other people with respect, um, having some sense of, of um, you know, equality in, in the workplace, and, you know, on and on it goes. We could, we could fill in a lot of the details. And I, I think a set of normative principles will, in general, avoid uh, the difficulties of relativism on the one hand and absolutism on the other hand. Um, so... Yeah, if, you're going to, if we're going to talk about moral problems, it's, it's got to be somewhere in between those extremes. Um, you, you can't call something murder and then claim to have a moral problem with it. Um, murder is a moral conclusion about a killing. We can have moral problems about whether a killing is justified or not, 
and we do that all the time. And that's what juries are impaneled to do. They Juries sit to make decisions about whether a killing was justified or not justified. Um, and that's a, if they decide that it was a murder, they're drawing a moral conclusion that by definition, the, um, uh, the killing is not justified, okay? So anyways, um, so those are, those are the four items that I would um, include in, in the moral point of view, okay? Um, do any of you have questions or, or comments um, that you'd like? And please feel free to, to jump in. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you will do that as we get going. And again, I understand maybe this is kind of introductory for a lot of you, but um, um, I'm still feeling a need to go through it. So do any of you have any comments or questions? Please. Thank you, Professor. When you say a lie is something that we should do or think about it, at least, uh, you're including on lying the fact that people are omitting something. That they are they're not telling the truth. Yes. Right. But they're not lying. They, they choose not to say anything. Yes. Is this a lie for you or it isn't? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, uh, Aquinas, remember, remember, good Catholic institution here. Thomas Aquinas, uh, somewhere in the in the Summa, he he lays out um, seven or eight different forms of deception, right? And um, for me, just to tell you an untruth, like it's snowing outside. Now you know that's not true, and you know I'm lying, and my utterance is a false utterance, and I evidently did it to try to mislead your belief about something, right? Um, I can mislead your belief in all kinds of ways, and that's what those seven different things in Aquinas are about. I can, mis I can mislead your belief by silence, uh, and, I, and that's, I think, what you're getting at. Um, there, yeah, there are different ways to do that. Um, I could mislead your belief by... Um, um, agreeing with you about something that I know is not true. I mean, you could be mistaken about something, and I could agree with that and reinforce your um, false belief, and that would be a form of deception on my part if I did that intentionally. I want you to believe something. Um, you believe not P, and I know P is true, and um, I say, yes, you're right about not P being true. So I'm contributing to your false belief. So there are different, I don't remember all seven of them, I'd have to go back and look, but, but um, uh, yes, there, there are different ways to, to, to do that and carry that on. That's a good question. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Uh, why did I choose those four? Um, part of it has to do with um, just teaching just a practical issue of teaching. Uh, when students come into uh, an undergraduate, I teach undergraduates for the most part. I've taught a couple of graduate courses in my career, but um, for the most part, I teach undergraduates. And when they come in, um, they want to know what ethics is about. And um, we will spend our time in a, in a class over a semester unpacking what's involved in that. But that's a shorthand for me as to what gets involved in, um, in ethics and in, the, in adopting the moral point of view. Um, students do not read, readily recognize the truth of universalizability. Again, it's a very ugly word. And for them to be thinking, this is the core of ethics? I thought ethics was about right and wrong. But for, to give them a word like that, um, um, sort of throws them off, but, but again, I mean, people argue about this, but, but um, the golden rule that we have, um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, or the, um, um, what was it, Hillel, who said, um, don't do unto others what you wouldn't want done to you, and then the, that's the silver rule, and then the, plat what is the platinum rule? The platinum rule is, um, 
um, treat others as they would want you to treat them. I should treat you the way you want to be treated, um, um, that kind of thing. So um, it's, it's a way of, um, actually the, the challenge of, of, of something like universalizability is Kant's challenge, which is that um, ethics claims to be objective. Um, a lot of people who um, go into an ethics course as an undergraduate, and those of you who are gonna be professors someday should just realize this, um, they, they think everything is relative. It's just your opinion against mine and nobody's right and wrong. And you know, um, uh, in ethics, we can just have all these debates, but you can't really resolve anything. It's just all subjective. And um, um, it's, it's been my experience that even the concept of subjective is objective. It's just non-public. Subjective truth is, is, is something that is true, but not public. Um, my example for that, um, the one I, I've used is, um, the Olympics were here, right? Just not too long ago in, in weren't they in Rio, the, the, the Olympics? Weren't they here? Yeah, well, um, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so um, you, you've all watched the, um, um, the scoring of uh, oh, like a gymnastics act. Somebody gets out to do a floor exercise and they tumble and they turn and they do all these things and you go, oh my God, that's amazing. And the scores come up and the scores come up 7.2, on it, and you go, well, how did they, how did they do that? Well, the thing is, um, there, there are criteria, and there's a way to get into that, but on the outside, it looks like it's subjective, okay? You look at a, how can you tell that that floor exercise is objectively a 7.2? Well, if you've been trained in how to score them, then you learn how to do that. And when somebody's score is way outside the, the realm where they're landing, somebody, somebody might be cheating, okay? And that's how they know that too. And they have found judges. They've accused people who have been judges of cheating, um, showing bias towards their own country or something like that. Um, but, but the point is that from the outside, it may look subjective, but it's not. It can't be, not if you've got a 7.2, 7.1, 7.2, 7.3, they're real close. And they're applying what they understand to be the standard. And they've been trained in it and they know how to do it. From the outside, it looks subjective, but what it is is objective, but non-public. You and I don't know all that training that allows them to, to make those scores, okay? So, um, so when students come in to take an ethics course, they will often think that it's just all um, subjective. It's all opinion, your opinion against my opinion, and we can't solve anything. And what um, a concept like universalizability provides is a claim that um, ethics is actually objective, okay? And this goes back to, um, um, you know, Kant's uh, categorical imperative, where um, you know he, where, where he talks about, um, you know, uh, the model for this being natural law, and and um, at the time he was coming up with his categorical imperative, these are the years when um, we're living in the wake of Newton's discoveries of natural law, like the law of gravity. And what that law was, was that uh, gravity is the same in London as it is in um, you know, Rio de Janeiro. It, gravity functions the same way in um, Cape Town as it does in Philadelphia. You know, that it's a constant, okay? And, and it, it's, it's an objective reality about the world and Kant believed that you could, um, you could think about ethics in a way and the moral life in a way that um, is akin to a natural law. I mean, it's, it's, it's right in the categorical imperative itself. That's what that language is about. So it's the Enlightenment era's confidence that um, um, we can achieve a kind of objectivity 
in, in ethics, and the concept of universalizability is, is how we do that. Um, so if here it is, if it's right for me to do it, then according to this law, it's right for you to do it. And if it's wrong for me to do it, it's also wrong for you. And if it's wrong for you, it's wrong for me. It, it, okay, it applies to everyone, just the way the law of gravity applies to everyone. That was the model in the Enlightenment era, okay? You know, what we do with uh, contemporary physics and applying it would be a whole different thing, wouldn't it? <laughs> but at least we have the Enlightenment model for, for keeping us clear on that front. Okay. Other Conditionality of ethics. Uh, why wouldn't we include uh, rationality, for example? Well, I, I well, uh, I guess that's a good point. It may be that they um, they assume rationality. I guess um, I think that would be my my response to that. You can't have a an appeal to universalizability without the capacity for recognizing that it's the case and that it makes sense. So, um, um, yeah, I wouldn't have a problem. I mean, yeah, I, you know, ethics does want to um, to, to claim that um, reason and rationality are are fundamental to to the moral life and. Um, um, I, I would argue that in my own ethical perspectives, that's always a part of the discussion. So, yeah. So I don't mean to discount it at all. As a matter of fact, I think it's it, it's so fundamentally important that um, it just informs everything else that's going on. So I guess that would be my response. But not a bad thing to keep in mind. So other questions or comments just about getting underway here? So, anyone? Okay, um, if not, um, all right. So, Now, in, in, in the course that, we're, that you're taking, that we're taking together, um, there are a couple of things that uh, I, I want to do with this uh, from, from my perspective. Uh, okay. okay, all right, thank you. Um, uh, I want to focus in Obligation, punishment, and um, I'm just going to call this, it's, a, it's more of a catch-all, but I, I want to call it emotions, okay? So, um, so what we're going to do in, 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 the, in the class and these are, I just want to keep some ideas um, at, at the forefront so that we can keep ourselves focused on some topical issues. So um, when it comes to obligation, what kinds of things are we talking about? Anybody want to throw anything out? Well, we can think about something like accountability. Uh, accountability. We could think about something like responsibility. Okay. These are all obligation related ideas. Okay. Uh, we want to think about a full. Where does the authority come from to impose an obligation on you and on me? We want to think about um, justification and reasons. Uh, 
we might want to give some consideration to religious issues. There are a lot of people in the world who think that the reason we have obligations is because God has uh, uh, imposed that upon us. So, um, uh, we also, obligations, we want to think about the moral community and what role it might play. Okay? Uh, and uh, there was another one here. When I think about apology, this could fit other places. And, uh, there are interesting issues that come up, up around responsibility uh, because we have uh, the reality of diminished capacity for some reason. That's kind of a legal phrase that gets used for it. But um, how responsible is a person that we might be considering punishing if um, if they're the, the victims of a mental defect or they have um, experienced so much disadvantage in their life that um, they sort of don't know how to act in civil society. There could be different things that come up around that. Okay, But one of the things that we want to focus on um, as we go forward is to think about obligation. And those are the kinds of, of things that um, I think are worth keeping in mind, okay? Do you have any questions or comments about those or additions or other, other things? Okay, all right. Um, uh, punishment, all right. I'm sure, was this the idea that got a lot of you into the class to try to figure out the punishment piece of things? Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting topic. And the thing is that we have um, different theories of punishment. Um, let's see, we have, um, we have utilitarian theories of punishment. And does anybody know what the focus of utilitarian theories of punishment is? Um, what's the point of looking at punishment from a utilitarian point of view, what are you trying to get out of punishment? What are you trying to get out of punishment if you approach it from a utilitarian um, or consequentialist point of view? Any, any thoughts there? No? It's usually a concept of deterrence. Um, that you're, you know, utilitarianism is the philosophy Trying to what seek the greatest good for the greatest number, it has it's directed towards um, um, social improvement and for the, the greater good of all. So, what is the good, right, and fitting thing to do? The good, right, and fitting thing to do is that act which maximizes utility, which could be pleasure, could be happiness. Um, we have Christian utilitarians who even use love. An example. It's the most loving thing to do for the greatest number. It is the, the thing that maximizes happiness for the, for the greatest number. Um, okay, so the focus is in on social welfare, the, uh, the greatest number. And punishment theories that are utilitarian are aimed at the, the idea of, of um, preserving the community and um, uh, advancing the community and bringing greater welfare to the greater number of people. So by punishing wrongdoers, you are deterring other people from committing crimes. That's the theory, okay? If you deter other people from committing crimes, you are living in a safer, better social environment. So punishment, if it achieves that end, makes for a better society. That's the idea. Okay? That will be coming up um, in your readings. Um, and if you've gotten into it, you probably have seen that already.
Uh, oh yeah, yeah. So retribution. Uh, is a is another way of coming at the the question of punishment. Does anybody have an idea as to what retribution means? Instead of punishing someone, you try to solve the problem when two people uh, between two people. And you, for example, I get your car and I have to convince you about it. So I get your car back and what I do to solve the problem? Because I cause a bad things to you, so I need to do something to solve this problem. Is it something like this? Yes, I know. There are two words here, there, and there are two different um, notions here. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe what you're talking about is this other one, is restitution. Now, I told you, ethics is filled with ugly words, right? Okay, here we go. So, retribution is kind of what we associate with the um, idea of an eye for an eye. So, um, retribution, See, if you, if you stole my car, eye for eye thinking means I get to steal your car, okay? It would be that kind of thing, retribution. Um, and um, it, it is associated with um, uh, that people, the word that's used in philosophy to describe this is the idea of desert. This is not desert, dry air, this, is, this is desert, uh, this is the idea that you get what you've earned, that you you get what's owed to you in virtue of what you've done. So um, if I um, if I perform some kind of a criminal act, and I steal money from you, um, on retribution, um, I should be punished for that because I did something wrong and the dessert uh, this is what I am owed by the society uh, for doing that. The, you know, the classic language we use about this, um, and again, this is language you will find in Kant, is, um, is, is the idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Um, it goes back to the, it's a very old notion, it goes back to the Hammurabi Code and, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and it, all, it originally, I mean, this is, Retribution seems like kind of a harsh thing for us to think about, but it was originally uh, a reform because um, uh, what happened in the old, old days was that if you, um, um, you got in a fight in a bar, all right, and um, you, um, you, you knock somebody's teeth out and you belong to a certain tribe and the person that you injured belongs to another tribe. Um, the way this got resolved, and this is prior to Hammurabi, this is a long time ago, um, is that my tribe would fight your tribe and because of a fight in the bar, you know, there could be 60 people dead by the time we're done with this. My people fight your people, your people fight mine. And the idea that came about with Hammurabi and, and others, and you, and you find some of this in the, um, in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament as well, but the retribution notion um, individualized this so that if I get in a fight with you in a bar and I knock your teeth out, um, retribution says that we don't have to get the clans on each other. This is a matter between me and you and the government who come in and, and kind of adjudicate this work settle this or find some kind of solution to this problem where I, the person who caused the harm, will receive a harm um, for doing that. And again, is there a deterrent effect in that? There could be, there could be. Um, but usually people who talk about retribution are really talking about um, the idea that you're taking on the consequence of, um, of being a wrongdoer and you earn, that's the dessert, um, you earn um, 
a, a, a kind of retaliation, and it usually comes in the form of pain. If you have caused, if I steal money from you, I steal your car, um, I'm causing you pain. And the idea is, can we devise some kind of punishment that provides an equivalent kind of pain for my having done that wrong thing? Okay, so it is, um, it is a notion that's often referred to um, equal pain or, or some kind of equivalent pain. Maybe equal is not quite the right word to use there, but but um, but that's why we throw people in prison for long periods of time. Um, that's why uh, I mean there are. Societies where caning still goes on. In the Philippines, don't they still do that? Um, or in Malaysia, um, that if you commit certain kinds of wrongs, uh, um, you may be caned for that. Um, I had a I had an interesting conversation one time with a uh, with a philosopher from England. He was actually, I think they they called him a regal philosopher. Uh, he was teaching in a Scottish university, and um, but he thought they should bring back cor corporal punishment. The idea that you get um, in, in kind of a public scene, uh, if you commit a wrong, that we will, we will spank you in public. And he thought that, that the advantage of that is society is doing its just dessert. It's giving you back what you have you know, a punishment in retaliation for what you've done. And it's not ruining your life. It's causing you pain and distress, but um, it's, it's once and over, okay? You may not be able to sit down tomorrow, but a week from now you're back at work and your life goes on. You're not stuck in a prison for 10 years. You know, um, it's an interesting idea. Um, most of us think of returning um, that kind of pain, or even literal eye-to-eye -eye stuff, um, as, as barbaric, actually. And I don't, um, in the one, there was a reading that you were given, I don't know if you got to, I think it was one of the things I did, um, um, it's toward the end of the week, but um, I do tell the story about this situation, um, was it Saudi Arabia, where a, a, a man blinded a fiance, with acid, and she went to the Sharia court to ask the court to see that the assailant was likewise blinded with acid as, as an equal punishment. That was the desert and the equal um, pain in response to what was done. And there was a big human rights outcry about that. Um, and, you know, the idea that the court would sanction. Um, acid being poured in somebody's eyes to blind them as a punishment for what they had done um, it didn't seem to be um, uh, a, a fair punishment. But it, it does take literal eye for an eye thinking. You know, um, I mean, Gandhi's the one who said it. You know, if we observe eye for eye um, ethics. Pretty soon, everybody's blind. And um, yeah, so we, we, don't, we don't do literal eye for eye, um, tooth for tooth um, punishment. We try to find some kind of equivalent that imposes a painful desert upon an offender. Okay, and it's usually, it's usually prison. Um, there are some countries that have the death penalty and do, do things with that. But um, usually we're talking about prison Okay. Um, yeah, restitution. Uh, is something that we associate with restorative justice. And um, the idea there is um, that if, um, if I steal money from you, um, 
the appropriate response would be for me to pay you back what I took from you. That's the restitution. And um, then do what I have to do to create um, some kind of restored balance in our relationship. The fact that I offended you and hurt you means that um, I am responsible for um, trying to rebalance our relationship. So restorative justice is, um, is about restoring balance. And we'll have some readings and some things to talk about with respect to that. Um, and this is something that's trying to get away from retribution and from um, utilitarian or consequentialist um, theories. Um, there are a couple of others that, um, again, these are, these are theories. Um, there's a natural law theory of punishment. I'm not going to say too much about that right now. Um, it's actually one that, um, that I operate in, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time um, when we get to it uh, explaining why. Um, I, I think this is a good way to go. There is also um, contractarianism. Uh, it goes back to the idea that we are in a, a social contract and um, it also has some things that I would find in the natural law ethics. Both of these um, have things in them that play off of deterrence and retribution, but they don't collapse on those things. They're really trying to do something else. Um, they can accept some kind of um, personal responsibility. They can be concerned with the, the outcomes for society um, as a whole, but um, both of them become uh, ways of thinking through uh, punishment that uh, uh, that yield a different result than just inflicting pain on somebody or um, you know punishing somebody with the end of uh, uh, improving society as a whole. I mean, one of the big problems with um, with the utilitarian. I mean, most of us think that that um, to put an innocent person in jail, much less to execute an innocent person. You know, in the United States, um, there was a moratorium put on the death penalty back in 1972. And by 1976, states had um, rewritten their death penalty laws so that um, they, they satisfied the requirements of the Supreme Court. And since 1976, there have been 160 some people who were convicted and sent to death row who have been released for reasons of actual innocence. They have been released. The courts make mistakes, okay? And um, the idea, if you, if you follow a utilitarian viewpoint on this, you could, you could argue this. It's a horrible thing, I'll admit, if an innocent person winds up getting executed or winds up serving a long jail sentence. But in the long run, it does deter other people from crime, so it's justifiable. That's how you could argue. When you get into these things, this is where you start to find the, the flaws and the theories. Because um, if you think that that's an okay thing to argue, um, that it's okay for an innocent person to, to suffer unjust imprisonment or execution for a crime they didn't commit, then that could be any, we're gonna do ethics, right? Universalizability, that could be any innocent person, that could be you. You've never committed a murder, right? And if you're saying it's okay on a utilitarian calculus for an innocent person to be put to death because even that death contributes to the larger, larger um, social welfare and provides deterrent effect, um, that could be you. It could be somebody you love. So uh, here's where we go with that. Um, there are also vices and virtues. 
that, that get involved. Um, virtue ethics, uh, sometimes we talk about this in terms of uh, axiological ethics. They're different, again, ugly words for it, but the idea that um, you know, a virtue is an excellence of the soul and, and justice is something we want to, um, to play off of. And, and um, this also can come in, into play. Aristotle has some interesting things to say about um, retribution. Um, but what I believe he meant by retribution was some kind of restoring of societal order and not just inflicting pain on somebody um, to give them their just desserts. OK. Um, the, um, I'm just wondering, should we, should we take a break? Is it, did you want to do that? I, I, how are we supposed to do this? Three o'clock? Three uh, thirty? Okay. I mean, I can keep going for a little bit here. Do you want me to do that or? Okay, well, let me. Okay, let me just do this little piece of it then. Um, there's a whole group of concerns over here um, that are relevant that are relevant to um, our discussion that um, are going to come up in, in your readings and in what we want to talk about. And there's a bunch of them. Um, one of the major ones is resentment. When somebody does something to harm you, if somebody does something wrong to you, you resent it. You're upset about it. You could be angry about it. You could be. Um, uh, let's see. There are issues of empathy and sympathy. Uh, there are issues in punishment related to humiliation. Okay. Um, there are questions about the role for remorse and forgiveness. Um, let's see, guilt, yes, guilt, blaming, and indignation, okay? Um, if somebody has harmed you, um, these are all things that can come into play around the, the question of, um, of punishment, okay? So um, I think I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, and um, I think the point of taking a look at this is to, is to try to lay out the kinds of concerns that we want to address in this um, it's going to be a four day long course. Okay? And um, some of our readings are going to focus in on particular aspects of this. Um, one of the readings for today was um, to talk about retribution. And um, I think maybe after we do have a break, we'll, we'll come back and, and, and chat about that. Uh, right. So that's laying out some of the. Uh, the primary issues at stake in the course. Um, is, is there a response? Are there things that you think we should be covering that are not up there? Um, things that you would like a little bit more information about right now, just to, before going ahead? Or um, You know, um, just to say this, in the United States right now, we just had a judge promoted to the Supreme Court, and it's been a very um, difficult and uh, divisive um, a hearing that was before a Senate committee. And a, a woman came forward, uh, Dr. Ford, to accuse the 
Supreme Court candidate uh, from sexual improprieties when he was a college student at Yale. And, um, um, I don't. I don't know if this is if this got into your readings. One of the um, things I um, sent down. Um, I, I didn't actually look to see if it was included, but um, there, there's a whole discussion that goes on about um, women who are victims of sexual assault. All right, and um, what it, it's it, it interesting. Um, they asked this woman, uh, Dr. Ford after her testimony, would she want to see the judge impeached if he actually was put on the court and he has now been put on the court? And she said, no, I didn't want to see him impeached. You know, that would be a sort of punishment for him for what he did. Um, what she wanted was to have a voice for something that has interfered with her life. And um, the, the reading that I actually had talked about sexual um, abuse issues and those who are victims of them as experiencing um, indignation for having been subjected to this kind of abuse. And that's one reason um, uh, Dr. Ford came forward. She felt um, um, a civic duty to let people know about this. That was, that was one issue. And um, she was... Um, uh, you know, wanting to uh, to state in a in a public forum something that happened to her that has really negatively affected her life. Now she's overcome a lot of things, and, um, and she's a very successful person. But it lives with her, and those um, Americans who heard her testimony, everybody was riveted to televisions watching her testimony before a court where she accused um, this 30 years ago. But it was a you know a, a college drinking problem. Our colleges are just filled with drinking. They still are, and um, this was a, a consequence of that. And um, what she wanted was not to inflict some kind of huge harm on the judge. What she wanted was to express her indignation about what happened, and she wanted uh, people to know about it. And um, um, you know, she was, she was hoping, I think she was seeking some kind of um, personal peace with it all. And it, it's, I mean, it, it, the whole thing has been kind of a mess in American society, but um, and it's a very troubling thing. But the point, the point is that um, um, there is a, when these kinds of assaults on human dignity take place, often um, what people want is an opportunity to express their indignation about them. Their dignity has been attacked, and they are indignant. That's sort of what that means. And um, the idea of expressing and, and finding voice after their voice has been crushed. And, and you know, one of the scenes that she described was him uh, putting his hand over her mouth, and she was afraid she wouldn't be able to breathe and that she would die. And, but that's also a way of silencing the scream and silencing the voice. And she has um, lived with that experience of being silenced um, all these years. And um, she sort of broke her silence, you know, in front of a national audience. It was really quite a remarkable thing to see. Um, and you couldn't watch that without believing that she had been sexually assaulted. Um, I find that hard to believe that, that she was somehow making that up. I think she did. Um, anyway, that's um, just, just one of the points that's going on here. Um, are, there, are there questions or, or concerns you have at this point or anything you would like to um, bring up? Please, uh, uh, I wish to discuss uh, some problems about these uh, main theories uh, on punishment. For example, the utilitarian view. You mentioned the utilitarian, the consequentialist uh, view of punishment. We have the problem uh, that you could uh, punish the not guilty person, or even you could uh, punish the guilty person so hard 
And in this way, you can uh, think that this is unfair. Uh, in the retribution uh, approach, we, were, uh, we have some problem too. Uh, because uh, uh, when you punish uh, something, so, uh, we have the problem because the state wish uh, do some uh, wish uh, that the person feel pain. And also, it seems unfair. And the restitution uh, view, we have a problem too. Uh, it seems so individualistic. Uh, so, so individualistic. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the problem of, of, of punishment uh, seems to be a social problem, not uh, just a, a, a problem by two individuals, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, just a quick response to that. The utilitarian response really would say that this is a social issue, that the, that the focus of it should be uh, future directed and um, punishment is having an effect, a consequence, consequentialism. It's a consequence that is going to make society better and safer and reduce crime and all that. By punishing people, we're sending a message that we will not tolerate um, criminal behavior, wrongful behavior, and, and the consequence is that we will make society better. The retribution business with dessert, is you're right, that is very much um, focused in on individuals. So um, it, it, um, uh, it, it, it's, you know, I commit a crime and I have to pay. It's my just desserts, we say, for me to go to prison or for me um, to uh, have some kind of um, uh, punishment that, um, you know, provides um, you know, some kind of adequate social, social response um, for that. Is that getting at some of what you're saying or not. Um, um, I, I, I think when we talk about the individualized nature of punishment, it really is something to associate more with, with retribution. And again, the, the advantages um, of both the natural law and the contract view here is that they want to pay attention to social consequences. They want to pay attention to the individual but they don't want to collapse it there. Yeah. Um, they don't want to let either one have full say, that there's, there are some bigger and broader issues at stake in how you would think about punishment in, in both of these uh, perspectives. And um, yeah, that, that punishment, I think you mentioned punishment, um, is an institution. And it's one of the things that um, uh, we will have to keep in mind here, because punishment is set up in our legal systems to serve certain ends, and the ends that they serve are determined by what kind of a philosophy you bring to it. Um, there are philosophical groundings for how a particular society uh, wants to think about punishment and what the objective of it is. Um, you know, we, Amer I've been in American prisons, and I've been on death row in America in two different states, and um, um, they're very unpleasant places. First time I visited a person on death row, I, um, I you know, was put in a little, I was put in a little cell, um, that, uh, and the, the inmate was brought in. Uh, he, he was strip searched before he came in, and he came in in shackles with his uh, feet and and hands all bound up with with chains. And this whole time I talked to him, he was he was chained, and. Um, the, the speaking we had, this was a very old prison, had um, like mesh wire along the sides of the, of the glass window, and we would have to kind of turn and, and talk to one another through the mesh wire. Some places have phones that we use, and that the more modern places will have phones. But there's a glass wall and no contact and all that. So they're very, they're very harsh uh, settings, even for people to go in and, and, and talk to somebody. And then there, there are prisons in the world that are not like that. There, um, and even in America, there are some prisons that they call country clubs. And they're for wealthy, um, politically influential people. 
Um, but there are European prisons where um, you know, the, the settings are not all that bad. It's probably closer to being in a, a college dorm than it is, um, not that I want to make a college dorm comparable to a prison, please don't think that. But, um, but they're, they're not a harsh, savage environment, and um, 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 in American prisons they, they often are. And um, the, the, the kind of um, um, meanness that goes on in, a, in attacking um, the issue of punishment can, can vary quite widely culture to culture and even jurisdiction to jurisdiction within a society. So there are, there are um, lots of uh, issues having to do with um, the, the way we respond to individual offenders and even where um, decisions even get made about in, in the legal system about what prison people are sent to. And, um, you know, and sometimes those things wind up being quite cruel. Um, in Pennsylvania, I, I know of a, a person whose home is in New Jersey, and we have prisons very close to New Jersey, and they made a point of um, putting this inmate as far away from New Jersey in the state as possible, so that family members who want to go visit can't, can't do that with any ease at all. It's a 330 mile trip for them to make just in Pennsylvania. So there are, um, there are lots of um, um, individual things that happen with respect to um, um, how, how people are treated and um, how, how they're treated individually with, with respect to those, those kinds of things. So, was that getting, I, I, I kind of got off the track there a little bit, but, but um, was there anything you wanted to follow up on? Just to, just to state the problem? Or? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, are, there, are there other questions, concerns, issues? Well, I think what I would I would like to do is um, is, is maybe uh, do a little bit of conversation around the um, um, there was an article that you were um, you were given by Christopher Bennett or Bennett um, called the varieties of retributive experience and you were also given. Uh, an article by Peter Strawson, uh, Freedom and Resentment. Have, have any of you read the Peter Strawson article before? Okay, one, one person has. Yeah, it's one of these classic articles that sets up a lot of issues um, around uh, punishment and using this um, emotion factor over, over here at the end, um, these reactive attitudes that we, we generate. So um, I think we can, uh, maybe have some conversation. I'm, ju I'm just thinking that in terms of what I want to do today, this would actually be a good time to have a break because um, we're kind of done with the introductory stuff and, and we can start maybe talking about a specific, um, a couple specific things. Um, maybe this Carlson article and the, and the Bennett will talk a little bit more about um, the role of resentment and um, uh, sort of a different read on what retribution is. Um, I hope this article shows you that retribution can be something other than simply an eye for an eye. Um, it doesn't get rid of the idea of suffering, but it does get rid of the idea of an eye for an eye. And the idea that what's at stake in retribution is an infliction of pain. And it raises an is interesting issue um, whether you can um, uh, inflict suffering for a good end without it amounting to an infliction of pain. I leave that for your contemplation. So how long would you like a break to take? 20 minutes? Is that okay, all right. Okay, so we'll come back, um, about, what, about 20 till, somewhere around there, and we'll have a little more discussion. Okay. 
Okay, we're going, we're going to get underway. Um, uh, one of the things that would be helpful for me is maybe to hear from some of you as to why you're interested in this course and, and doing this. Um, if any of you would like to share anything, um, just, just curious. Anybody? I'm assuming the topic is of, is of interest to you. I've um, actually never heard of me before, so, but um, why is the topic of interest to you? Um, does anybody have any anything they want to share about that? Have any has anybody here ever been into a jail or a prison? You you. You want to explain that? Well, in the United States, people people visit prisons. Um, um, I I run a prison project at my university, and about every semester, um, I put about twenty to twenty five students in a local county jail, and um, they go in there to do tutoring with inmates who um, are working on their high school equivalents. It's an exam, it's called the GED. It's an exam that if you take it and pass it, it counts as a high school diploma. And when you apply for a job, if you say you've got a GED, it's like having a high school diploma. It's much easier to get a job uh, if you've passed your GED. And um, um, students, uh, go down into the basement of the prison. It has a new part and an old part. And the old part of the prison is 19th century. It's got old black stone on the outside, razor wire all along the top. I mean, it's a pretty intimidating uh, place. And um, down in the school, the students go down and they sit at a table next to an inmate who may be working on geography or mathematics, algebra, things like high school um, topics, um, social studies, history, um, science, different things, all, all the areas where they'll be tested when they take these exams. And um, they spend about 90 minutes a week, one, one time a week, and they go over in groups, and the school is only open for tutoring at certain times, and um, getting things scheduled is very difficult because student schedules are so um, filled. Um, so, um, but they do that. We've been doing this um, since 2008. Um, and this project came out of a course I taught that was called Practical Justice. Um, it was a service learning course. Do you do, you do service learning things? Have you? Is that a concept you use around here? Well, the, the idea is that uh, you will study a topic and you will try to find some kind of project that's hands-on in the community to do that corresponds with what you're studying. So it's learning and it's service. And I taught this course called Practical Justice that put some students in a local elementary school, some were working with um, a health um, initiative in, um, in the area where we live and work, and then one was part of the prison. And um, the students who were involved in the prison really found it very meaningful to be going over there and, and helping out. And um, once the class was over, um, since I had these relationships built with the people in the prison, I just asked them if they would be open to um, um, continuing it. And um, I was originally going to try to set it up as, as credit-bearing, um, where students would read some books about the prison system in the United States and about mass incarceration and things like that. The students didn't really want to do that. They just wanted to do the, the work of tutoring. So it just became a, a tutoring program. But it's had a, a big impact on them. They, um, um, they really do. I, and I, would go, I haven't gone down this year because my schedule wouldn't allow it. Um, and the prison has cut back hours, and the one day I'm free to do this, I, I haven't been free this, this um, semester, um, this, yeah, this, this year. So, um, yeah, but I've been doing this for a long time, and um, 
the students really feel like they're doing something meaningful. And um, they, they do a lot of things in their college careers, but a lot of them, it turns out, don't think that some of what they're doing is all that meaningful. <laughs> um, but this they do, do seem to enjoy. And um, so um, it's, it's, it's had a, I've, I've had students tell me it was the most important thing they did, they did while they were in college. So um, that's kind of a nice thing. And I had a professor who um, participated in it. And um, when she left Lehigh University, where I work, she, she told me that it was the best teaching experience that she had because the students who were there were really interested in learning. And they really paid attention and really worked hard. And a lot of the students that she had in her class were somewhat lackadaisical, kind of, that they were um, um, not all that serious about their, their, their studies. And, um, um, but the students she worked with in the prison um, were very serious about, um, about things. The problem is the, that prison in Northampton County in, Pen in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has a 70% recidivism rate. 70% of the um, inmates who are in there are going to wind up back in there at some point. So um, a project like this is um, designed to work on that problem. And so, so, so anybody, um, so nobody here is, well, we have one exception. We've had one person who's been in a prison um, well, there are all kinds of ways to get into a prison besides committing a crime. Um, um, in the United States, um, you know, there are, there are church groups that go in, there are education groups, there are people who teach yoga who go in and do things with inmates. Um, there are classes. Um, I, had a, I have a son who um, participated in a federal prison teaching program at the college he was at in, in the state of New York. And um, my one son also, um, um, was it in Nashville, Tennessee at Vanderbilt University and while he was there he he would ride his bike, it still drives me nuts, he would ride his bike out to the um, Deep River Bend um, prison, maximum security prison where death row is and meet with a death row inmate every, every Monday afternoon. And um, um, so people do find their ways in to do things. There are churches that um, have um, contact with um, uh, educators in prison, and most prisons have some somebody in charge of uh, what we might call community relations or educational opportunities who um, will work to uh, help people gain access so that they can run a program. There are lots of Bible programs. And the churches are really interested in this, and there are lots of Bible programs. Um, but we've had some students at Lehigh who have um, taught creative writing programs and things like that who've, who've gone into the prisons. So, yeah, so um, like I say, it's, uh, um, it's, it's been something that's been quite meaningful for the people who've participated in it. So, so nobody has anything to share about why you're here doing this? I'm just curious. I, I'm new to your country, and um, um, I know you had a, was it a, a former president who wound up in prison? We have a present president who may be heading that route himself. Um, there's an investigation going on, but I, yeah. Goodness. Um, no, nobody. Nobody has anything? Okay. Go ahead. In which war? Hmm. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you see how that works? Works. <laughs> well, you'll have to tell me at the end of this whether anything happened to enlighten you about that. Um, I mean. Okay. Well, very good. Thank you. I appreciate hearing that. Appreciate that. Anybody else? Well, um, we've got a. Uh, there were a couple of articles that um, we we set out. Um, were you able to look at these or not? Um, one was by Peter Strawson. We, we mentioned this before. Um, the, the the freedom and resentment. Um, these, these are kind of technical, philosophical, um, and, and not necessarily easy to read um, articles um, if, if English is not your native tongue. And the other one is um, uh, Christopher Bennett's uh, Varieties of Retributive Experience. And I do want to spend a little bit of time on, on that if we, if we could. Um, but I wanted to say, maybe if we could talk first maybe about um, the, some of the key concepts in the Peter Strawson article. Um, this, is, this is called Freedom and Resentment. And um, he, he is looking at the issue of um, obligation, all right? And it is, uh, this article uh, affects a lot of the readings that you're gonna have in the course. Um, you will see, what is, what is one of the central concepts that he comes up with? that he wants you to pay attention to. Anybody? Well, do um, you need this up any longer? I, I'm assuming not. So Strawson's article talks about reactive attitudes. Anybody have a thought as to what that means? What do you got? Need? Okay, it, it's the reaction of the, I, did, I just couldn't hear what. Qualities of the will, is that what you said? Re, okay, reactions of the, the qualities of the will. And, and how, what form do they take? Um, a reactive attitude, um, people um, have something going on when they have a reactive attitude towards something. And, what do we typically associate that with? I mean, you're talking about the will, and you are right about that, because it does have behavioral implications. It affects the behavior. But the reactive attitude itself, um, what would we associate that with? Feelings. Yeah, um, the, the reactive attitudes are things that um, 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 we, we have an emotional we could talk about it like that too, an emotional response to um, uh, d different things that happen. And one of the things that he's taking on here is, is the uh, question of resentment, okay? And resentment for him is a, um, is a reactive attitude. Can you think of other things that he might have mentioned for which we, that, that are reactive attitudes? What other kinds of things 
would be like reactive attitudes for us. Other angry, anger could be one, yeah, yeah. Um, what else? Anything else? He talks about gratitude being a reactive attitude, doesn't he? Gratitude can be an emotional reaction. Anything else you can think of? I'm trying to think of some, I'm sorry? Indignation, okay, okay, yeah. Still up there. Yeah, yeah, most, actually, most of the things up there are reactive attitudes, aren't they? For, um, um, uh, yeah, resentment, anger, uh, forgiveness. I think, I think he explicitly talked about, um, mentions forgiveness in there being a reactive attitude. It's, it's one of the things, um, yeah, it, it, so that's an, it's a, it's a, beha it, a reactive attitude is an emotional response to something that happens to us. And he's saying that um, these things are not just all, de when, we re when things happen in our lives, and he is trying to personalize things and to think about the human person. And when things happen in our lives that affect us and affect our behavior, it's often the result of something emotional that's gone on. So when we feel resentment, which is the topic of things going on here, what kinds of things would have happened in our lives to make us feel resentment? Anybody? Okay, when we, we've lost something and um, how would we lose it? Exactly. So somebody, if somebody um, uh, commits a, a crime against us, um, that would be the sort of thing to which we could respond with resentment, right? Uh, so that would be a that would be a reactive attitude. Um, and what do we want to do when we experience resentment? We want to make the person do what? Pay. Yeah, we want to make the person pay. They, they have hurt us, and we have an emotional response um, to that, and it, um, it, it plays out a, as resentment. Um, does that make sense to you? Does that, that seem like it? Is that your understanding of how people work? that um, if, if somebody um, cheats you, somebody breaks a promise to you, somebody um, criminalizes you, uh, they, they, they commit a crime against you, they injure you in some way, they harm you in some way. Um, and a spe you know, it's, it, if a friend um, uh, harmed you, would that hurt more than if somebody I don't know, just walking down the street came and snatched your wallet or your purse. And would it, would it hurt more if um, a friend um, did something to betray you or um, do, you th do you think um, sort of impersonal or personal, how would that work? Any thoughts about that? Please. About what was lasting? Okay. Um, so, the, so there are. Um, yeah, I, I'm having. I'm, I'm not catching. I'm not catching every word. Uh, j just because, uh, as I was telling Professor Dennis, um, I, 
I, I hope you're hearing me. I, I do want you to participate. I'm just having a little trouble up here. There's, a, there's an echo in the room, and it sometimes um, um, interferes with my ability to catch every word you're saying. So I, I apologize for that at, at the front end. So if I repeat, if I ask you to repeat yourself, please, please don't be offended. I, um, uh, but you were, you were talking about the, the indignation piece of it and the, um, what was the first part of that you were? The, oh, the threat threatened somebody. Yeah. When we when we know somebody, it causes a deeper a deeper sense of resentment than when. Yeah, yeah. I think that's I think that's what Strawson is arguing that um, that um, and and this becomes a, a kind of model for us in thinking about reactive attitudes, because um, um, when you experience something personally you understand um, what this emotion is, this, this, um, this indignation, this resentment, these, these, they're negative emotions that you have, this desire for retaliation, uh, to get, make somebody pay for what they did. And um, he is saying, I think, that um, we transfer, I mean, his word in there, I think, is vicarious. Um, but it's the idea that we transfer this personal indignation um, that we experience and that we know we would experience from a friend betraying us. We transfer that impersonally to crimes that take place. And, and um, so I may be repeating what your, your point was, but I need to do this for myself too. Uh, so um, we we know what it what the hurt feels like. We know what the emotional reaction and our behavioral reaction makes somebody pay um, that kind of thing, and we transfer it to crimes within society. Okay. So even though I don't know that so and so, I, I don't know personally the person who may have killed another person. When I read about it in the paper, I can get very upset and transfer um, that whole experience of indignation that I could experience as a as a reactive attitude, and and place it on an impersonal kind of experience. And Strawson's point in doing that is saying that these emotional reactions are how we get around to thinking about questions of obligation and authority and, um, um, and, even, and, and ultimately questions of punishment. How do we want to establish um, uh, punishment and on what, what grounds do we, do we want to do that? Um, so the, the focus isn't just on abstract issues of violating the law, but, but the issue that re, re, resentment um, comes about, and, and, and you know, the title of the article is Freedom and Resentment. What's the role that freedom plays in, in uh, thinking about these reactive attitudes? Does anybody have a, a thought about that? Anybody? Let me, let me ask you this. Um, um, if I had some kind of a, well, let's say um, I, I uh, stole your purse while you're walking down the street and I run away with it, um, and you get very upset, you have a reactive attitude of resentment, okay? What would happen if um, I got caught and they take me before the judge and you're a witness and you find out that I'm mentally retarded? Okay, you find out I have some kind of a mental defect. Um, does that change your reactive attitude toward me? Okay, I see some heads nodding yes. Why would that affect that? 
I mean, your purse got stolen, okay? Your wallet got stolen. And what difference should it make? Okay. Okay, so there, there's a, yeah, there's some kind of an appeal to empathy. Um, it's, it's like if you, if you find out, um, you know, the law, I, I don't remember. Law has this idea of diminished capacity. That um, um, what does that have to do with freedom? Yeah, if you've got a diminished capacity, um, can I hold you as accountable? And are you as responsible for a wrongful act as somebody? who chooses to do a wrongful act. You know, um, so a, a person with some kind of mental defect steals a purse, steals my wallet, and runs down the street, and I find out that the person has a mental defect, and it, it affects my uh, evaluation of that, of that person and of what that act means. And the idea would be that um, I, I probably bring in some kind of, um, uh, it's like the person has an excuse, okay? Um, there are people who are placed in situations where they have an excuse for um, participating in a wrongful act. And the question then is what does that do to the resentment? What does that do to the reactive attitude? And I think Strawson's trying to make the case that it affects it. It affects what that reactive attitude could be. Your resentment um, diminishes um, along with the diminished capacity, okay? And it depends upon the question um, of basically a freedom and, and, and free will. If you have free will, that means ideally that um, you have the option of running down the street and stealing my purse or um, just walking along the street and passing me and leaving me alone. If, you're a, if you've got free will, you've got a decision to do either one of those options, right? And if you opt to do a wrongful thing, then my reactive attitude is very much a tie, tied to my understanding of the amount, if you will, of freedom that you have. If you have diminished capacity, it lowers um, the the kind of attention that I negative attention I want to give to your to your motivation. It affects it. It makes me think that you you have an excuse um, of some sort. Okay, so I, does that sound like what Strawson is getting at in, in some of this? Does that sound familiar? So, see, one of the questions I think he's he's asking is. Um, when is resentment justified? Okay, when is resentment justified? Um, and his answer, I think, is that resentment is most justified um, when the agent who is engaged in wrongful behavior is free not to engage in wrongful behavior, okay? So why would somebody um, um, in, in engage in wrongful behavior? And it would be for, um, you know, reasons like taking advantage, you want something for yourself, you've, you've got all these things that, um, that violate our, um, I mean, we could talk about violating our social contract, we could talk here about, about um, um, uh, misusing freedom. One of the reasons we, we seem to put people in prison is because they have misused their freedom. So if somebody, somebody's real crime is to misuse freedom, putting them in jail or prison would be a way of saying, you missed your, misused your freedom, so we will take your freedom away from you. Okay, it's like giving a child a timeout or something. Please.
start over. <laughs> like we are saying that we are saying that uh, there are some capabilities that. You Uh, can miss uh, the relevant knowledge of the situation. So I can be a target of blame. So you can be a target of blame yeah. If, yeah. You, if you misuse your freedom? Yeah, uh, like if I have to be another, if I have to present another capabilities besides freedom, like knowledge, uh, like situation, context. Uh, okay, uh, so, yeah. There are other things that could affect, um, that could affect um, uh, the reactive attitude. Right. So your, your degree of freedom is one of them. The idea of a mental f defect. Context could affect. Um, you, uh, there are people who are in situations um, where they are forced to do things um, that they would not ordinarily do, but the context sort of requires them to, or some greater harm is going to come to them. And I think Strawson talks about some cases like that. But, um, um, you know, it's, it, um, if, if somebody were to carjack you, you're driving your car, you stop at a light, and somebody gets in the car and pulls a gun on you and says, stop over at that bank, and um, a person uh, holds a gun on you while their partner goes in and robs the bank and you're still driving your car, you're like an accessory to that crime and you're doing something wrong. But um, in terms of um, reactive attitudes and all that, you're, you've got an excuse. Um, I mean, even if the law were to do something to you, and I don't know that it would, um, um, you've got an excuse and we, we don't ha hold you accountable. It's that there's some degree of freedom that we want to attribute to an agent in order, in order to hold them accountable and subject them potentially to punishment because that's where that comes out. Um, the idea that a person is responsible for what they're doing, they are accountable, and we have to ask accountable to whom. That becomes a question um, of importance too, and different people we will talk about will have different ideas about that. But who who are you accountable to? But you could the point is you could be placed in a situation um, where your freedom is taken away from you, and you are forced. You are there's coercion involved. You are coerced. You are forced to participate in an action that it, that you know is wrong but you do it anyway because a greater harm could come if you don't. Um, so that, that would be, yeah. Uh, Strawson does talk a good bit in here. Um, and he pays a lot of attention to the idea of people having excuses for, um, for things that they get caught up in. And he, he wants to have that come into play. There is this problem, though, about, about freedom and um, you know, because there are lots of things that can affect that, you know, your, your freedom. It may look like a person is perfectly rational, but, um, uh, geez, um, you know, what, what role, you know, that, 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 uh, there, there's an issue of moral luck, the kinds of things that, that um, can, uh, can, uh, can affect your, um, I mean, that's what you're really getting at there. Um, uh, but there are lots of things that could affect you, such as um, poverty. Um, you know, I was sharing the other day, um, talking about um, death row inmates in the United States. It is very rare to find a death row inmate who has not been the victim of sexual abuse. Okay? Um, plus, um, um, you'll never find a rich person on death row. You won't. Rich people can afford lawyers, and um, uh, knowing how to do um, a death row, uh, a capital crime defense is a very specialized area of law, and people who know how to do it can prevent um, uh, their clients from getting a death penalty. 
okay? Um, so it's very, very rare. But wh so what role does, you know, the people who wind up in death row are unlucky. There's your moral luck concept. They're just, they are really unlucky. There are 15, 16,000 murders in the United States, and there are like, what, 70, 70, 80 people, something like that, who are sentenced to, to death. And um, I think in 2016, there were actually 20 executed. So 20 people executed and 16,000 murders. Now, how unlucky do you have to be to be one of those 20 people? Okay, seriously, I, you know, moral luck. <laughs> uh, yeah, and the, and the people who are executed are um, um, often have, there's a whole thing going on right now. Uh, there's a, a Supreme Court case um, in the United States that is going to consider a person who is suffering from dementia. Um, I don't know if it's Alzheimer's or not, but it's a very serious dementia. This person um, cannot remember what a toilet is for and um, soils himself all the time. Uh, his, his cognitive abilities are so destroyed that he doesn't know how to use a bathroom, a toilet. And um, they want to execute him for a crime he did a long time ago. He had no memory. And there, do, do you execute somebody and hold the person accountable when um, they don't even know what they've done? I mean, for whose satisfaction is that? Um, how is that going to, yeah, well, you can just raise all those questions and it's going before the, the Supreme Court. There were just hearings. Um, there was a hearing before the Supreme Court on that and we'll hear um, how, how they rule on a question like that. But they have in the past thought that um, retardation um, is, a, is a mitigating, a lessening um, of responsibility. Um, and we would not execute a person. If they were, when they committed the crime, they were too young, if they suffered a mental defect of some sort, uh, retardation or something. But, um, but those are the kinds of things that come into play around this. That you could, this per, the reason they're going after this person, by the way, is that he killed a police officer, which under state statutes in almost all states that have the death penalty is an aggravating circumstance. Okay, it's one of the things that is likely to get you a death penalty. If you kill a policeman or a firefighter, it can increase the likelihood that you will get a, um, a death sentence, especially if it's in the commission of another crime. So that's aggravated um, um, circumstance. So that gets into the legal things. Um, but, but if a person is retarded, if a person is suffering a mental defect, um, even the law has um, recognized at the level of the Supreme Court that that um, should be affecting our reactive attitude and lessening our desire for revenge or payback, um, at, least, at least with respect to, to killing an individual like that. Okay. So. Yeah, if I, if I make references to the death penalty, I know Brazil does not have a death penalty, but it's a reality in the United States, and it's, it's something I, I know about. And um, like I said, I've, I have I've visited death rows, and I've actually been a spiritual um, advisor to a death row inmate um, who, com who can be very guilty. He committed a heinous crime. But I see him several times a year and um, spend some time talking with him. And uh, yeah. Anyways, um, so I, I can't help but that's the thing I know best. So, um, so we're talking about re, uh, reactive attitudes and we're asking the question, Strawson's question, as, as to when is resentment justified? Um, and um, um, he, I think his answer is that we have these emotional um, reactions, these feeling reactions that, that are understandable and um, they are also transferable. They go from knowledge of the kind of reaction we would have if we were personally um, affected by an injury, uh, we can transfer them to impersonal situations that, that happen out there. And we, we do this quite a bit. 
Um, but there is this question that is raised about the role of freedom, which is why that's in the title of the article. Um, how is resentment affected by the degree of freedom to, that, that you have? If you're a free agent who is willing to choose the wrong thing, then, and to do something criminal, something that violates the law, um, how does that affect um, the kind of accountability we want from you? Okay, um, that's a it's it's a profound question. It's it's a, it's an important question to ask because you can also raise questions about people who intentionally break the law. Um, this would be your Mohandas Gandhi. This would be your Martin Luther King. Um, they break the law intentionally because they believe the law is an unjust law. And um, are they obeying the law when they're violating the law? In a sense, they are because they are willing to take the consequences. Of, um, so it's not like Martin Luther King, you know, you know, hid behind some bushes and, and shot county sheriffs in Alabama or something when nobody was looking. No, he went out in the streets you know, with a sign and walked down the street and um, got himself arrested and put in jail. He took the consequence of violating the law. And um, um, there are reactive attitudes about that kind of thing, too. Um, what, if the, what if the law is unjust? How do we go about? Um, the, I, you could make the case that the kind of demonstration against unjust laws by people who are willing to pay the penalty of an unjust law, therefore that's unjust, is itself um, a reactive attitude that helps to change the law. The fact that King broke the law and went to jail for it helped to get rid of unjust laws. Gandhi, Gandhi the same way. You know that, if you've ever seen the movie, you ever see the movie Gandhi, where he, he says to the, uh, it's a great scene where he says to one of the British uh, um, uh, magistrates, the uh, magistrate says to him, so you think the British are just gonna get up and leave? And he said, oh yes, that's exactly what I think is going to happen. That's what happened. Um, you know, the appeal to conscience there. So there are different kinds of, you know, reactive attitudes can happen in, in, in different kinds of ways. And um, forgiveness can be a reactive attitude. Um, and that can come, uh, that can play a big part in, in, in thinking about, about punishment um, as well. Um, so, um, so, yeah, moral indignation somebody mentioned and um, so yeah there was a um, yeah some of these I, did you find this a hard article to read if, those of you who did read it, it I think it's a complicated article I mean it's a, I, I think the language in it is difficult and and uh, um, yeah so uh, he, he does get into questions about obligations because um, he, he wants to talk in here. Um, he, he uses, it's page 57 is one of the places where he talks about vicarious, vicarious, um, um, the things that are experienced personally can be um, that other, when these things happen to third parties, third persons, um, um, they become vicarious ex experiences that we understand because of how we would know this if it happened to ourselves. And, um, and he says, just as there are personal and vicarious reactive attitudes associated with demands on others for oneself and demands on others for others, so there are reactive attitudes associated with demands on oneself for others. And here we have to mention such phenomena as feeling bound or obligated, this is the sense of obligation, feeling compunction, feeling guilty or remorseful or at least responsible, and the more complicated phenomenon of shame. So um, um, we, we make demands on ourself, reactive attitudes become demands on ourself for others, um, and 
what he's doing is is locating um, um, obligation in moral community. That's different language. Please. Yeah. In, in Portuguese, we have just one translation uh, for accountability and responsibility. Okay. Can you explain <laughs> the difference with examples? Um, okay. Uh, okay, when, when somebody is um, responsible, it means I think that there's um, some kind of causality involved in it. So um, if, um, you know, I drop this pen on the floor, um, I'm responsible for the pen getting onto the floor. Um, I'm responsible for that. Um, I am the causal agent, if you will, for that, that happening. That may not be a good example because that's sort of an accident rather than a, a causal action. But I, I'm still responsible. Um, you know, if I don't put enough um, uh, gas in the gas tank and I run out of gas, I'm responsible for that. Um, accountability is, I think, um, something that others um, um, do. Others um, hold you accountable um, for things that you do. So I could be responsible in almost a neutral sense for the pen getting on the floor, but you could hold me accountable for that because you could assess what the consequences of that are and, and say that because of the consequences, such and such follows. So the pen falls on the floor, so what? Um, but if, and, and um, uh, you run out of gas, um, all right, well, it's an inconvenience. You've got to call somebody. You know, there's an inconvenience on the other hand. Um, but if I was supposed to put so many pounds of fuel in a, in a jetliner, and I'm responsible for doing that, and that's my job, and I'm responsible for doing that, and the plane is flying over the Atlantic and runs out of fuel for some reason, um, maybe not a great thing. I, I'm accountable for that, which means that other people would be holding me accountable. And that means I could face various kinds of censure for what I did, including um, um, perhaps even some kind of liability and even criminal liability. Um, so um, it, it, I, I think the distinctions between the, the two, the fact that they're collapsed is not a bad Thing, you know, um, it's not a, any kind of a deficiency in, in, in Portuguese or in, in the language. Um, I, I think when the philosophers use the distinction in English, they are trying to uh, distinguish a kind of causality, causing something to happen around responsible. Um, a, a, a person is the agent who brought about, who brought about such and such a result. And accountability is, um, is saying that there is um, a result of that that um, could lead to further moral assessment, okay, accountability. And the accountability could, could be really minor, and it's something that could be major, you know. I, um, universities in the United States, I don't know if, if this is the case here, but you know, insurance is such an incredible thing and lawsuits, everybody sues everybody for everything in the United States. So we have these offices of what we call risk, risk management. And um, what they do is um, try to uh, get people to act responsibly with respect to um, um, acting in conformity with rules and regulations and not creating undue risk um, for things that go on in university life. You know, so professors shouldn't put undergraduates in the car and um, with bald tires and put them at risk on an icy road or something like that. Um, don't put people at, at, at risk. And um, if you do, 
then we hold you accountable in the sense that there are consequences for that. So I think it's, it, it's a distinction between um, causality, which can be sort of neutral in a moral sense, and accountability, which I think has more moral weight to it, that we want, when we hold somebody accountable, we want to assess the moral meaning of what it is they've done. That may, might not, that, they may be a very minor thing, to, they might not look any different when you get done in certain situations, but there could be cases that come up where there's a, a real difference between, between somebody being responsible for something being happened and serious um, um, results when we do a moral assessment of what they're responsible for doing. And then we're holding somebody accountable. Does that help? I, you know, I, I, okay, all right. That's what I got on that. But that's, that's, a, that's a good question. And that helps me uh, un understand um, why you might have problems with something like this. Um, so, and if you do, you know, and that's a good thing for me to know, uh, just so you know, if, if things going on in here um, don't make sense to you, they might not make sense because they're not clear or they don't um, translate into a, a cultural frame with ease. And um, um, so, uh, uh, you know, I, I, got, I got trained in this kind of stuff, so, uh, you know, when I was an undergraduate in college, this wouldn't have made any sense to me. But after I get trained in it, you know, it makes a different kind of sense. And you are students going through the that process yourself with this. So um, it, it's you know, if it doesn't make sense to you, that's fine. It's why we're here um, to try to, to help clarify that. And like I say, I'm not going to have the answers for all of these things. Um, but the, but I will say that this particular article has had. Um, a major effect in shaping, um, in creating a kind of reactive attitude to, uh, to thinking about the role of emotions and um, things like diminished capacity in holding people um, accountable for wrongdoing. And punishment is um, a way that we hold people accountable. Uh, because you have done this, and this is a violation of our community standards as enshrined in law, we may uh, subject you to punishment. We may put you in jail. We may make you pay a fine. We may kill you. you know? um, so it goes on like that. So, uh, do, you, do you have other... Um, uh, yeah, he talks about delusional people on, on, yeah, an insane delusion. Um, yeah, he has different kinds of people that he uses to, to illustrate how our reactive attitudes can be affected um, and how we can um, alter the, the sense of responsibility that we'd attribute to people. Um, yeah, so do you have other, or, um, There is discussion on, on just, oh please, I was just going to say on page 63 there is um, some discussion about the institution of punishment that is raised and maybe we'll take a quick look at that, but please let me. Moral obligations. <laughs> Our moral obligations about uh, with people uh, for the future, people uh, people that uh, yet uh, not born, people have not exist in, in present, people to the future, yes, generations future, uh, or and. Uh, people, our obligations and responsibility, moral, uh, with people um, that far away from me, like countries, distant countries, or uh, like, and Peter Singer uh, write about this, and um, his, he writes, uh, may. Uh, 
the omission, uh, omission aid the, uh, that rich countries with the poor countries, uh, United States and Africa, United, uh, United States or England, uh, have omission aid uh, with Africa, for example. Uh, what our big, our moral obligation or moral responsibility with people or that future and people for far away from me? Well, that's a great question, and it's a it's a classic question in modern ethics. It's um, it's a question uh, Peter Singer addressed um, quite a while ago, and then he he wrote a book called One World a few years. Do you know Do you know Peter Singer? Do you know the name? He's a utilitarian philosopher, the author. I'm sorry. But the author, yeah. Oh, well, he, that's exactly the question he raised. Um, um, he wanted to know, I, he, he, the first stab that he had at this issue, I think, was in the 1970s when um, uh, the, oh gosh, where was it? Um, uh, gosh, it, it, famine had broken out. And the question, um, you know, over um, in Bangladesh is where it happened. And he raised the question, what obligation do people in the affluent West, United States, Britain, uh, countries where the standard of living is pretty high and there's wealth in those countries, what obligations do they have to poor, starving people in a country like Bangladesh? And um, he, uh, he's in, like I say, he wrote this article and he sort of updated it for a, um, a 2002 book, something like that, called One World. And so the article is still out there and he obviously still stands by it. But he wanted to make the case that um, in the human moral community, we have obligations to one another. And the fact that oceans separate us and distance uh, separates us should not affect our moral obligations to help out. And he uses examples like, um, uh, you know, if you were walking down the street and there's a, um, a fountain with water squirting out of it and a young person was in it and fell face down in the, in the pond, and you know, it, it's just deep enough that maybe they can't get up and they're gonna drown, and you look over there and you've got a pair of $800 Italian shoes on um, and you might get them wet and maybe ruin them if you get into the, the water to save this child, what should you do? And he says, um, the minimally decent thing would be to save this child. The minimally decent thing to do. And uh, so get your shoes wet, ruin your shoes, but save a life. We have a moral obligation. Um, and he wants to wind up saying that um, when we look at examples like that, geography, uh, be because of the massive communication systems we have, where nobody is a stranger to anybody anymore, um, that we, because we have awareness of what's happening in a place like Bangladesh, we're aware of the hunger and the famine and the death that is taking place there, that um, we should be using our resources to help out. Okay, so when it comes to questions about what kind of aid should be given, this is where he gets controversial for Americans because he says every American um, should be giving to places like Oxfam, uh, places that address world hunger, and they should give to the point, they should give of their personal wealth and their resources up to the point where giving any more, it's a marginal you know, return kind of thing. But uh, you, you give up to the point where if you gave any more, it would start to harm you. So it's all the excess. All the excess wealth you have should be turned over to help people who don't have enough. And you will find people who will argue things like this, you know, why should I have two cars when everybody doesn't have one? It's that kind of thing. So I shouldn't have two cars. Um, 
that kind of thing. Uh, uh, so, I, I, so one of the one of the answers to your to your question is that um, um, well, it, it's just to answer it with another question, and the question is: Should something like um, geography be an obstacle to moral obligation when communication systems have opened up the world to us? You know, 500 years ago, if if you're um, living in, you know, the Amazon and there's famine going on in um, the Indian subcontinent, are you responsible for that? Do you have any accountability for that? And I think the answer would be no. There, you know, you're dealing with a situation of ignorance. You, you, you couldn't do anything. But it, I, I think a, a lot of the premises for a great deal that goes on in ethics today goes on because we have access to a degree of knowledge about the world that we never had before, and it opens us up to greater and greater awareness of um, moral responsibility, okay? Especially when we have disparities in, in, in wealth between rich countries and poor countries, and there are people dying. Um, do wealthy countries um, have an obligation to help out countries where there is um, uh, a lot going on? So, you know, with, with global warming, a lot of this may take some new terms, new turns with that because the United States right now is being battered on the East Coast and the West Coast with, uh, uh, we're, we're receiving a, a great deal of um, um, natural disaster that um, uh, is very difficult to pay for and, and all that kind of stuff and, um, uh, you know, decisions that we make and responsibilities we have about dealing with um, global uh, climate change um, could all affect, uh, these, these are issues that affect the entire planet and what kind of an obligation do we have? One of the problems we have in the United States is we have so many um, politicians who want to deny that there's, there's such a thing as global warming and it, it, just makes, it just makes the situation worse. So, um, but it, no, raising the question, um, if you didn't know this, you should know this, this is actually a classic question in contemporary ethics and it's a, it's a very serious question and I, I think there's reluctance to deal with it. Um, we don't want to deal with it on the policy front. Um, you know, where we want to deal with that kind of question is when there is a natural disaster that takes place and the cameras are there and it brings it home and puts it in our living room and then we go, oh my God, we got to do something and we want to help and we, you know, we give our dollars to Red Cross and to different places and aid goes there. Um, so um, I think people really do want to, to help out with that. And um, it is a recognition. Um, this isn't just um, um, kindness and charity. I, I, I think that's not necessarily the way to look at it. I think it's an acknowledgement that we have a moral responsibility to, to help people who are suffering this kind of disaster. It's, it's a moral issue, not just a, a charity issue. Um, when something like that happens, you know. Um, other, are there other questions you would like to raise? I, I do want to spend a little time on the other article, and you know, we'll, and we can come back to things. Um, I would assume that you know during this week a lot of things will be raised, and we'll come back to them. Um, um, I should tell you, I I do kind of jump around a bit, and. Um, um, you can jump around too. It's it's fine to raise whatever kind of questions you want to raise. Uh, uh, for the good of the order, I don't need to be the only one responding to questions. I mean, if, is, uh, so if anybody else has something to offer, please <laughs> please feel free. Um, so. Um, Are there other issues that at, at this moment you'd like to raise about the, the Strawson article? I do think if you've got a basic handle on these reactive attitudes, it does put you in a position to, to think about how um, issues of punishment arise, um, a reactive attitude about resentment. Um, uh, 
um, leads to questions about um, accountability and then to questions about punishment. And um, so that's the logic of, of what's being laid out here. Please. Well, uh, I have a very simple question, but I think it is a central one. Uh, in the realm of uh, moral philosophy, uh, specifically in uh, immoral responsibility, uh, we, we put freedom as a central measurement for uh, holding someone accountable or uh, uh, saying that this person has a responsibility, morally speaking. Uh, but it seems to me that in a Strawson article, article uh, he seems to take a bit of a turn on the central measurement that is freedom. Uh, my question is, how is that? Okay, I'm, I, um, it, I, I got the simple question at the end. I just need to understand a little bit better um, Strawson's argument. Um, yeah, uh, my point is we have this, this classical notion, uh, this Kantian notion that freedom is a measurement for moral responsibility. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, so yes. Uh, it is Strauss. I think uh, take takes a turn. Uh, he doesn't think that we should take freedom as a central measurement for responsibility, but rather this react reactive attitude. Uh, my my question for you, if you could. Expand on that. Well, um, as I understand it, and please uh, feel to, uh, fee free to adjust this, the the measurement of of freedom is relevant because um, because reactive attitudes um, are very much shaped in response to the freedom that we see in others. Okay. It's not, um, I think Strawson is trying, and I think he succeeds. Um, he, he must succeed because Darwell, who's somebody else that you'll be reading, has, has, has located this um, idea of, of the second personal. But it's, it's the, you know, in, in Strawson, but it's the idea that um, accountability comes um, from um, the relationships that people have with one another. Now that may seem like a very simple thing to do, but it's, it's not because um, if you go to Kant, for instance, you know, where does obligation come for Kant? It comes from first person, doesn't it? Um, that's what autonomy is about. What's the auto in autonomy? It's me, you know, I have through reason, access to the moral life and the moral good and the moral law, actually. That's what his language would be. I have access to the moral law and I am able to discern the moral law and it affects how I will you know, engage with others. And um, utilitarianism is kind of third person, isn't it? Um, it's, it? Isn't the idea of utilitarianism, just trying to get at this right now, um, isn't it the idea that um, the greatest good for the greatest number, that's all impersonal. That's all he, she, it, they, you know. It's, it's impersonal. Um, it's not focused on, on, on interpersonal relationships. It's the greatest good for the greatest number is the idea that if I do action A, it will yield consequences impersonally for a great many, the greatest number of people. But the, but the focus there is really on third person stuff. And I think what Strawson is doing and what Darwell is gonna pick up on 
is, is the idea that the way we should be looking at questions of obligation and accountability is through the second person, that the authority for this is not a use of first person reason like Kant or third person reason like utility, like Mill and Bentham and people like that, but a second person. In other words, you and I are mutually accountable to each other. I am accountable to you for what I do. I'm responsible to you for what I do, and you to me, and all of us to one another. It's a, it's a horizontal fr uh, frame we're talking about. It's a different way of, um, I, you know, I said this is, sounds very simple, but I think if you put it in the context of first-person Kant and third-person Mill, um, you see that something else is being offered here. Now, in my own, you know, I didn't get this, um, and I, 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 maybe I'm off on this, but I didn't get this uh, notion from Strawson. I got this understanding of what he's trying to do actually from Martin Buber. I don't, do any of you know who Martin Buber was? He was, he was a Jewish philosopher who wrote a very famous book called I, Thou. And um, in English, um, uh, well, in, you know, there are, there are different languages where you will see this, the, um, where you have a, um, um, a familiar, uh, Vosse I don't, um, is kind of the informal notion for you, and and what do you do? You have you have a formal word for you, um, but there are languages that do that, um, uh, um, where you'll have a sort of informal word for you, and then a more formal. It's um, I'm trying to think what. Pardon? Okay. Vosse. It's two, two. Okay, well, see, okay, that, that's the idea here. The idea is that um, we can have um, formal relationships with one another, right? We all, we all do. But you can also have this kind of um, breakdown into intimacy. And in English, this is the word thou, okay? It is a very personal um, notion, and it, it, has, it conveys a sense of intimacy, like a husband uh, I mean, nobody talks like this in English anymore, but, but it would be um, like if I said to my wife, um, I wouldn't use um, a distant formal um, C or uh, um, you with her. I would always um, try to use an, uh, a more intimate form of uh, something like thou. And what, what the translators are playing off of in his book, I Thou, is the idea that you can have different kinds of relationships in the world. Um, you have a relationship to yourself. You can have a I-it relationships, third-person relationships. And we have, you know, if you go down to the store and you give, you know, you buy a pack of gum and you give some money to pay for your gum, it's not like you're um, uh, um, in some kind of intimate relationship with the person you hand over your money for gum. It's, um, you know, that person's there, it's a transaction that's taking place, and you have this kind of I, he, I, she, I, it sort of relationship. And we negotiate how we live um, with lots of I, it relationships. You know, the person who services your car, or, um, you know, you don't, I mean, you can build up relationships with all kinds of people, but a lot of what we do is is kind of impersonal, and um, we, tr we try to treat one another with civility and respect and all of that. And Buber was, Martin Buber was offering this view that the most important relationships that we have are interpersonal relationships, where we, we honor the dignity of the person and we don't treat them as an impersonal it. We treat them as a thou. We treat them as um, 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 with this kind of intimacy of, of heightened respect, okay? And I think that's one of the things that we have going on in um, Strawson, and it's a long answer to your question, but it, it, it's what we've got going on in Strawson, and I think you'll see this reflected again in, in Darwell's um, notions of the second personal, that our relationships depend upon um, uh, our sense of obligations um, are generated on the authority of the second person, okay? 
And that is different from what Kant said and from what Mill said. It's a different from an I and a different from, a, um, from the autonomy notion where authority comes that way and, it, and it's different from the, the third person notion that you can get with something like utilitarianism. So it's a, it's a different way of um, thinking about ethical projects and establishing obligation and the authority for obligation because the authority for obligation is not coming um, um, from, from the moral law. It's coming from um, you as a, as a human being with dignity, my ability to recognize that in you and you recognize it in me. It's a mutuality um, sense of, of what obligation is. So it's a different way to, f to frame how that works. That's one of the things I think that's holding up the Strawson article. I'm not, I'm not sure it's expressed as clearly as it could have been. And I think Darwell may be expressing it with more clarity, but they're both tough people to read. <laughs> so, but thank you for the question, yeah. Um, are there other issues you'd like to raise out of this? And again, I, I don't think we've walked away from this um, by any means, but um, I, I would like to just say, uh, raise a few questions and a few issues about um, the uh, Christopher Bennett piece on um, the varieties of um, retributive experience. And, um, uh, you know, we, we talked about, um, just real briefly, about this idea that retribution is, um, you hit me, I get to hit you back. You cause me pain and suffering, I cause you pain and suffering. Um, retribution is paying like for like. It's paying back um, a, an injury and harm um, and a hurt with an injury, a harm, and a hurt. Okay, this is the, the old idea, retribution idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That's the classic retribution thing. It's an infliction of pain for causing pain. That's how we hold you responsible. That's your accountability, okay? Um, you are responsible for causing me pain, you're accountable for it, and you know, under a retribution theory, the classic retribution is that we will return an injury in kind for the um, injury caused. Now again, we don't, if a person rapes another person, we don't say that the offender needs to be raped. We try to find something proportional that's how we do this. Um, you know, since we already know most countries in the world don't have a death penalty, if you kill somebody, it doesn't mean that we have to kill you. It means there will be a penalty to pay. And, um, and actually, even in the United States, um, I, there are all kinds of people walking around um, the streets of the city working in McDonald's and things who've killed people. It's just that it wasn't a first-degree murder thing, and and, um, um, and and they're not spending their entire lives in jail, you know. Um, so, so, but that's the classic retribution thing. This article by um, Christopher Bennett um, is trying to get at the retribution thing in a different way, and near as I can tell, here's what I think the question is he's asking. Um, He's asking, is it a good thing, it's a retribution question, but is it a good thing that wrongdoers, offenders, undergo certain forms of suffering for their wrongdoing? Is it a good thing, okay, that an offender um, undergoes some kind of suffering for the wrong that they have committed, okay? Um, so what do you, any thoughts about that that you have? It's a way of, of rethinking a little bit the, um, the idea of, of um, retribution. Uh, do any of you have a, no a, a notion as to um, what kinds of suffering he might um, think would be appropriate or what, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Oh, um, I think this uh, punishment is very strange because uh, someone uh, have a bad thing and uh, your trade this or uh, diminish is with other bad things. Uh, punishment is uh, someone uh, have bad things. This is uh, in a certain way uh, violence uh, with more violence. Mm -hmm. So the, the violence being responded to with more violence um, and what was your what were you saying about that? Of that, it... Dim diminish is it okay? Uh, I think that he was saying that you can uh, actually cut down violence by imposing violent punishment to someone. Uh, I think that that he said that this is a slippery slope, that you can make a better world by better world by inflicting violence of any kind. Is that it? Uh, someone has uh, someone has bad thing. You're right. You're uh, out punished. Yes, uh, but punishment is bad thing. Uh, however, uh, uh, um, you're uh, opposing you know, more punish, more bad things in the world, in not uh, good things. Punishment is, is more is more like bad things that uh, than uh, good things. Yes, uh, punishment is is not uh, a good things in certain way. Is is seeing uh, bad. Well. One of, one of the, the things that's raised in the article is that um, suffering, um, if somebody does a bad thing, okay, um, retribution, which this guy wants to defend, um, he wants to say that we should inflict suffering. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're trying to inflict something like physical pain on a person. Um, the question would be, what kind of suffering is appropriate, is, is actually good, okay? Oh. Suffering is bad. Now, okay, now I got that. But it, 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 it is bad, it is bad without justification, but this theory of punishment this, this version of retribution, this is a retribution argument. You know, inflict um, a response and hold a person accountable individually, okay? This is how the institution of punishment is set up for a retributivist. Um, we're gonna hold a person responsible and they are going to get their just deserts. They have caused suffering, they are going to get suffering in response. The question is, what kind of suffering? And what is it aimed at? Okay, are are you with me? Uh, okay, <laughs> okay, fair enough. Okay, so um, so I think the idea of this article is that when you do something wrong, you have separated yourself from the moral community, which is upholding standards in the you know for appropriate and good and right behavior. So you are alienated 
from your moral community. And how do we get you back into the community? That's why this is good, because he's, he's arguing that we want to get you back to a good end. Um, if, if it's an eye for an eye, you poke out my eye and I get to poke out you, yours, there's no good that comes out from that. I mean, really, seriously, there's no good that comes out from that. But if you are alienated from the moral community because of something you've done, how do you get back into the good graces of the community? How do you get back into acceptance within the moral community? So he, he wants to say that our typical reaction to a wrongdoer is to um, withdraw from them. We, um, you know, we have a, a group in the United States, an old religious community called the, the Shakers, and what they used to do was, sh well, the Quakers do this too, um, but they, they call it shunning, S-H-U-N-N-I-N-G. So if somebody is a wrongdoer, everybody turns their back. They won't talk to them. Um, it's shunning. It's a punishment. And what's supposed to happen What's supposed to happen, it's a retribution thing. You've done something wrong, you've offended, we are withdrawing our relationships with you. Again, it is playing off of this second person idea again a bit. Um, what's going to happen is that you are going to feel shame for what you did. You have violated the community, and as a result of feeling um, um, uh, shame, um, you go through an internal, emotional, you know, people have a, a, a reactive attitude toward you, and you, um, because you feel this shame, yeah, well, okay, but that's, what, that's what's supposed to happen. That as a result of that, um, you seek restoration into the moral community, but the only way you can really feel the shame is to take the blame. Okay, so you have to acknowledge that you have messed up, you have done something wrong, and um, that is the thing that starts to open the uh, doors to connection with other people so that you can um, find restoration, reconciliation, all these positive things that come about. This guy wants to argue that all of that is going to be possible by allowing the person to feel blame. And he wants to say that is suffering and to feel shame for what they did. And um, it's that suffering that is actually good. Um, be, and again, we're not, we're not whipping people. We're not executing them. We're not, putting, we're not talking about putting people you know, in, in prison forever or something like that, but we want to do something to make sure that, um, that they experience both the, um, uh, the blame that is coming their way from all of those people who are alienated from them because of what they did. They, they want to experience the blame and then internalize it as shame. And once that's internalized, the, the, um, the mechanisms, if you will, will start so that they can be restored to um, moral community. Okay, that's the objective of this. It's a different way of looking. This is not eye for an eye. You poke out my eye, I get to poke out yours. This is, you poke out my eye. Do you know what you put me through? Do you know what harm this has caused me? Um, when are you going to acknowledge that you did something just horrible to me? And what kind of shame do you feel about it? So we'll go ahead, please. Uh, are we considering that breaking the law is always evil? Is always, always evil. Not just wrong, but evil. Evil. Yes. We, are we considering that breaking the law is always evil, not just wrong? Well, because maybe wrong but not evil or not well um when i'm doing ethics i avoid always <laughs> <laughs> no. 
you know, unless something's true by definition, because that changes it. Um, but it, again, this goes back to my Gandhi and King thing. Um, um, Martin Luther King Jr. was a lawbreaker. Was he doing something evil in breaking the law? Well, the authorities thought he was, but he's honored today as having created a different kind of societal context where um, the real evil that was being done was actually by the people enforcing an unjust law. So you have to hold out the possibility that laws themselves can be unjust. And, you know, Hitler, Martin Luther King wrote this, you know, in his letter from the Birmingham jail, and it's really quite a profound thought, I think, but he said uh, um, Hitler never did anything illegal. And it's true. Hitler was the source of all power and legal authority in the Nazi state of Germany. So if anything was done in his name, including the slaughter of six million Jews in the death camps in Poland and, and Germany, um, that was not, was not wrong. It was not illegal, but it was wrong. It was, it was a moral evil, and um, it, was, it was a moral evil and uh, an actually uh, legal act. And that's what the defendants at uh, Nuremberg said. You know, there was nothing illegal in what we were doing. We were operating under orders of the Fuhrer. And that's how power flowed in that, that country, you know. So um, I, I, I don't mind, you know, I, I'm not objecting to your, to your um, characterization of breaking the law as evil, but I, I, would, um, I would just say we need to um, think about um, which laws are being broken. I mean, we've got to pay attention to that because there are, there are big counter examples that can be put in your face and say, well, deal with Martin Luther King and Gandhi and Hitler, you know, and there are all kinds of, you know, we can, we can talk about. And those are good things to talk about, actually, because they, they make us more aware of the relationship between ethics and law. And it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence um, that way. So thank you for that. Is there another? Please. So uh, you were saying that if someone broke the law, uh, he should be punished because he, uh, that person violates the community and then be be. Uh, shame, few shame. Well, not just breaking the yeah. law, but they've done something more, yeah. morally wrong, which may wrong or doing. may yeah, which may or may not be breaking the law, but they've done something morally wrong for which wrong doing. the community is mm -hmm. holding them accountable. Yeah, you know, uh, adult adultery isn't necessarily um, illegal, at least in a lot of jurisdictions, but when it's committed, there are people who would withdraw community from somebody who commits adultery because of all the pain and hurt he's causing and stuff like that. So you know, there, are, there are examples you could come up to. Yeah. I've interrupted you, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Uh, uh, my question is, and now I, uh, uh, there is the question of what uh, it is that someone deserves if someone deserves to be punished. And if we punish somebody, what are the criteria that we are going to use as a point of view of justification? Uh, if, if it is possible to use some kind of objective criteria for someone who deserves to be punished, uh, criteria of deserving. That is my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it that that's that's a, a great question. Um, objective criteria for when someone should be punished. Now, again, you can raise that issue from a legal standpoint. You can raise that question from a moral standpoint. Okay, but the, 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 legal, the legal standpoint would be that we can put into law the objective criteria. 
And um, if you um, violate the law in this section, that section, and we can apply the law to you, we can indict you and charge you and put, put you on trial and um, find out whether you're guilty against the objective standard of the law. Okay, so that's one thing. The moral thing is a, is a, is a little trickier um, the, because the, the moral perspective may very well inform what the law is putting into place, okay? So there may be a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence between what we think morally and what the law says. On the other hand, maybe not. Um, different different uh, locales, different cultural situations may be raising some issues where it's not so close. So, um, so in that case, there could be um, um, criteria for moral evaluation that might be different from legal criteria. That would be the first thing I would say in response to your question. Are there objective moral criteria? Well, um, uh, I, I think I would like to say yes to that. Um, and the reason I say that is because um, I'd have to know what the offense is that we're talking about. Um, be, you know, I used that example earlier on about lying. Are there objective criteria for when a lie is wrong morally? And I think there are. Does that mean there could be objective criteria for when a lie is not wrong? And I would want to say I think so. Um, if, a, if a lie is not being done, is not being uttered, if you will, simply to advance my own welfare. See, I think most people who tell a lie do that for some self-advantage, right? That's the reason you tell a lie, or you cheat on a test. You do this for some self-advantage. Um, so that would be one of your objective criteria. If it's, it's wrong if it's doing that, and I think we'd have, we'd have to come up with a few more as well. Um, actually, I did, this in a, I did this around lying in a, in a book. I had like seven or eight criteria um, that I thought made objective sense. And when we get to, um, I took that down, maybe I took the wrong one down. But when we get to the natural law and maybe even to the contractarianism piece, I think we'll be in a position to actually specify some of those things. But, you know, is, is lying objectively wrong? If it's, if it's meant to, um, um, to advance my welfare over someone else by misleading their belief, um, I, it's wrong morally, okay? If, um, what would be an objectively okay lie? Um, something that is not done for my purposes but is meant to smooth a social situation. So, um, honey, how do you like my hair? It looks fine, dear. I like your haircut. Maybe not how you really feel. It may not be the truth, but it's smoothing out a social situation. And there aren't consequences necessarily from that. Now, there could be, you know, if, if you mislead somebody and because of that, you know, that's the problem with utilitarianism. The problem with utilitarianism, ultimately, I tell this to my, is that you got to be smart. You've got to be so smart you can predict the future because you're looking ahead to consequences. And who the hell can do that? Really, how, how can you see all the consequences? It's like from, you know, Jurassic Park, you know, the water going, you can't tell, chaos theory. Um, uh, things are always um, a little bit uncertain and up in the air and just to, anyway, I think you, it, it's not a surprise to me that you've got somebody like John Stuart Mill who comes up with, with utilitarianism. He was, he was judged to be one of the smartest people who ever lived. You've got to be really smart to be a utilitarian. And they think his IQ was like 210 or something. He was figuring out conic sections with broomsticks when he was three years old and knew Greek by the time he was five. And, you know, he was this enormous intellect. He left all the rest of us in the dust. Um, so that's how that goes. But um, it seems to me, um, I, I th you know, when I say pleadingly, I think 
think we can come up with something that looks objective. Um, I think we can do that. Um, I'm not sure we can do that around retribution so much, but we can do it with greater ease around natural law and I think around contractarianism. Um, we, we can establish some um, better moral guidelines than what we than what we have. So, so are we are we sort of out of time here? Are we um, just? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I've got a few more things maybe to to say about this um, this particular article and um, um, uh, the. Um, the, the way I, I, I and, we, and maybe we can revisit this uh, tomorrow when we get, but the way I see this article moving, I, I sort of sketched out, is that um, uh, retro, this version of retribution, which is, I think you have to recognize, an unusual version of retribution, okay? That's the first thing to recognize. It's, it's unusual. But he wants to say that there is suffering involved in being expelled, if you will, from the moral community. That experiencing this withdrawal of others from you is an initial experience of suffering. The, um, what he wants to have happen is um, a recognition that there has been offense against persons, others, and the, the whole moral community has been um, violated in some way, and that as a result of that, you need to experience guilt. That it's a recognition that I have offended. That's guilt, a recognition that I have offended. Then he wants to move you to shame, that which is the internalization of the guilt. If I feel guilty, if I acknowledge my guilt, the next step would be to internalize it and go, oh, geez, I'm ashamed of what I did. See, if I'm going to stand up and say I'm not guilty, I'm never going to experience shame from that, okay? Then if you experience the guilt and then move it to the internal thing where you're feeling shame for what you did, um, you can make a move towards reconciliation and towards repentance and ultimately towards restoration in the moral community. That's the piece. I mean, that's a wonderful way to think about retribution, I think, but that's the piece we don't do. We, in the United States, you know, when we do retribution in the United States, we hold it against you forever. You know, when you're released from prison, we keep you um, under the watchful eye of parole officers and all kinds of people for years and years and years. You're never reconciled to the moral community. Once you, you never get done paying your debt. Oh, some do, but, but um, they, they keep on you and um, they take away your right to vote. You know, after you've paid your debt to society, there are still things that will happen to you. They will make you check a box that you have um, been, um, uh, there's a whole check, check a box movement in the United States right now because on job applications, um, if you check this box saying, I have been convicted of a felony, um, an employer can look at that and just toss your application out. So there are all kinds of consequences for um, um, wrongdoing. And it's like the idea of paying a debt is, is never quite accomplished. So the idea of reconciliation and restoration and um, um, repentance being acknowledged by others and giving people a new start after they have offended is a, is a piece of things that hasn't been accomplished. You know, I don't know what things are like in Brazil around that, but it's really a sad situation in the United States. Do you have a, a brief comment you wanted to make? Okay. Uh, this kind of uh, theory of uh, restitution didn't seem like a utilitarian approach because it, you are it, restoring the agents to the community. You, you say it, it. You say it does seem like utilitarian. Yeah. It, well, it, like. it, um, I I understand why you say that, and I I think there's probably some truth to that. I. I think things, I think people who think kind of deeply about these issues 
um, want to do things like that. They want to say there is a utilitarian thing, but there's also a focus on the individual. All that guilt and shame stuff is individual. It's, it's the experience of just desserts. From That's the piece of this that is still um, um, in accord with, with retribution. But you're right. I, if this is about restoration into the moral community, there is attention being paid to the moral community. And it is future focused, and it is, there is a utilitarian piece to that. That's why I say I, this is not a clean, classic notion of, re, of retribution. It's a, a revised, humane form of retribution. It's, uh, it, it's actually quite interesting, I think. Um, anyways, that's why I gave it to you to read. So, okay, let's call it a day and we'll, um, um, I, I think um, uh, all I wanted to do today was kind of introduce the moral point of view and give you an overview as to the kinds of things we're gonna be looking at and um, all of that stuff that was up on the board. Um, there's no clean order in which all of that's gonna come up. It, it just will come up um, around things we're talking about. It'll come up around your questions. I would encourage you to, um, to think about questions you would like to, to ask. Um, it's, it's a lot more fun for me um, to know what kinds of things are on your minds and, and what kinds of things you want to talk about. Um, and, and sometimes these articles may provoke some thought for you, and there are things we want to we want to do here. I mean, we've got an assignment here in this um, in this period, and we'll we'll get to all that. But I'm really interested in knowing what kinds of questions and concerns you have about things. And um, um, so I hope you know as, as as we go through tomorrow, Wednesday, and and Thursday, um, we'll have a, um, um, a you know a chance really for you to to ask your questions and and. And again, you can ask them. They don't just need to come to me. And if you have something to say in response to another person, I hope you'll feel free to, to do that. I feel like we're I'm the lecturer up here, and maybe that's what I'm that's what I'm supposed to be. But <laughs> but I, I would would like some um, you know dialogue amongst yourselves as well. I I can learn from that too. Okay. So so thank you. So we'll.